welcome back to Start High School. Thank you. Uh, 2019, better be better, better be better than 2018. So uh, part of our professional development today, I just want to make sure that we are aware of this, has been a lot, a lot of collaborative work with Gloria, uh, myself, the entire building leadership team. Uh, what we have done this afternoon and what we're planning on implementing for the rest of this year, next year, is taking all of your guys' input, all of the input through the surveys, all of our administrative meetings, all of our BLT meetings, all of the stuff that we saw that there's a need here at Start High School and how are we going to make it back to being great again. Um, and so we listen to you. Uh, we're we're going to propose ideas and plans. We're kind of going back to the basics again, which is what's needed. Um, I can share this with you, not to be a complete Debbie Downer, but there'll be people in this room that are not going to be 100% satisfied. I get that. I 100% get that. We're trying to figure out what's best for this school, for you as teachers, for administrators, for the entire staff, and for the kids, and then what's best for them, uh, and somehow get these kids to graduate on time. That's really ultimately, we provide a safe environment for the staff and the students, and we educate these kids so they can graduate. Those are our goals when we have these, um, this professional development in mind, when we meet, and believe me when I say we meet, we meet regularly. Gloria and I meet almost every day. Gloria and Aaron meet every day. Gloria and Matt meet every day. Myself and the administrators, we meet all the time to try to figure out how can we make this place better. Um, Roxanne Allen came on board, which has been just tremendous uh, asset to us in the discipline and attendance part of it. Um, as we go through this PowerPoint today, you'll see just some more information that we're going to share with you. Um, this just, again, going to make things, again, tighter again. Um, and I remember, it's kind of weird to say, but I remember 11 years ago when I started here, it's a different start high school now than what it was. I get that but we're gonna change it back to the way it was with your help, our help, and so we're just, like this slide says, we're moving forward, and that's all we can do is move forward, and I'm just hoping everybody's gonna be on board with us as we move forward. Uh, so starting out tomorrow, uh, tomorrow everyone should receive, you should have received already your first hour um, students in the back wall over there when the kids come into, the, uh, into this cafeteria tomorrow morning. It will have each one of their students' names and the first hour teacher. First hour teacher has the um, schedule for the remainder of the day. Um, what we want to see down in the office is if the student comes to you and says, hey, Ms. Pasuela, I don't have a first hour class. Send them down to the BIC room during first hour. Like we've done in the past, we'll call them out of the BIC room. Uh, hopefully we can see them right away. We will only see students that have holes in their schedule, okay? Um, there's, a, there's a ton of scheduling already being with new people coming into the building. So just the way that it's going to work out is with new students coming in, the counselors have to create schedules for them. We're going to deal with holes with schedules first. We are going to try our hardest not to take kids out of classes still. Um, that's not something like, hey, this kid's not doing too well in my class, can he get out of my class? It's not as easy as you think, I, we've explained this, but it, there's always a trickle-down effect unless a kid just goes to a study hall. Uh, passing the trash is not an idea. We're not going to, this kid's a knucklehead in my class, uh, I want him out. Well, that doesn't happen as easy either because all we're doing is changing that knucklehead's class to a different class that's going to go into another teacher and cause potential problems there. Go through the due process with them. We're tightening up the due process, we're tightening up the discipline, we're tightening up the consequences, and hopefully we can go through the proper channels if we need to remove a student for whatever that reason is to do so. Uh, but again, students only with holes in their schedule tomorrow during that hour only. So if they say they want to go see their counselor, they better have a hole in their schedule that hour, otherwise they're not going to have an opportunity really to see their counselor, okay? Um, this is where Gloria gets to speak for about the next 10 or so slides. It has a lot to do with um, the survey that was put out and just kind of where we are with the building leadership team. Um, thank you. The survey was just sent out to TFT members and the, the results were sent out to everyone, but the survey was sent to TFT members. I want to say a big thank you. Um, we all work together. The building committee put in a lot of time, a lot of extra time 
with administration and the communications were ongoing and back and forth, so I hope that we've addressed many of the concerns. First of all, from our survey, 100% of the people strongly agree, most of 80% of those were strongly agree, or agree that we need changes, and you're going to see approximately 10 changes coming forward as we go through these slides. Um, the part that I am addressing is what we agreed to from the survey. 96.3% agreed to post a cell phone sign. And if you've been in the mail room, you'll notice that there are two cell phone signs available in the mail room. One of them is in red, no cell phone use at all. And the other one is yellow, that under certain, with permission, a student may use a cell phone. There's two sizes and you can pick which sign represents your, how you want your classroom to be run. So 96.4% have agreed to give one redirect. Posting your sign is your first warning. Your second is a redirect, put the phone away, something to that effect, Tell it whatever you do, pointing at your sign. After that, you can write a referral and we agreed to write a referral for failure to follow directions. And 91.7% of the people agreed to this change. Now, in the past, we've already agreed to this, but I took the survey again because we've had a lot of staff members um, change up over time. And you can see approximately 98% of the staff agrees to the 10 minute rule. No hall passes the first 10 minutes of each class period. We actually voted on this a few years ago and it was a very strong response, well into the 90% just like it is this time. And we're gonna hold ourselves accountable to this piece, not issuing hall passes the first 10 minutes. Also a few years ago when we ran this survey, we agreed to limit our hall passes to two or fewer students at a time. I decided, once again, because we have a lot of new staff members and people didn't get to weigh in on it, and the survey results were that 95.2% have agreed. So moving forward, we're going to limit our hall passes to two or fewer a class period, out at a time during a class period, not for the whole class period, but out at a time. If you think about that, if 75 teachers have two students out, that's 150 students in the hall. So it's quite a, quite a large number. Many people wanted me to change it to one student out at a time, but this is how the survey was written. You can make your own classroom rules if you want it to be one at a time. Um, so a repeat of what we agreed to from our survey. We're gonna post our cell phone policy. You can pick up the sign in the mail room. They look really nice. <laughs> they, look, they look very nice. They're two different sizes. No hall passes the first 10 minutes of each class period. And to limit hall passes to two or fewer students out at a time. Thank you. Next there. Hopefully when everyone came in, they received a green sheet. Can you hear me now? Okay. That review. That's over. That's over now. Okay. All right, so I just have to stand still. No moving. So I just, I said recently, just gave you a copy, you should have received a copy, a green copy of House Bill 410, which is known as Ohio's attendance policy. And you can see there are two different types of students. When we talk about attendance, those are students who are excessively absent. So those are students who have a combination of unexcused and excused absences more so more excused absences. And for those students, we only have to send a letter once a year just to let that 
Let those parents know they have, they're considered to be excessively absent. Now our students who are habitually absent, those are students who are unexcused or they're absent for reasons that are not legitimate. And for those students, we have to do not only a phone call, but we have to do what's called an attendance intervention plan. And say, I think it was in November, November, or the first part of December, excuse me, I think December 12th and 13th, I requested students to come down to the cafeteria, and those were students who had been flagged at that point for being habitually absent. And within our building right now, we between habitually absent, those habitually absent students, there were like 400 students at that point who were considered to be habitually absent. So that means, or that meant, or it continues to mean, that we need to do 429 attendance intervention plans. And I'm sure since the time I did that report, there are now more students who have to be added to uh, that list to do an attendance intervention plan. If you have not seen the plan, I didn't put it in this PowerPoint, but it's about a six page document that has to be completed. And it has to be completed, we can start it with the student, but then a parent or guardian needs to come in. Then it also needs to be reviewed with our attendance intervention team, which is now put in place. And we will now meet, I think it's the third Wednesday, I think, of every month to review those plans. And yes, we only have an hour to review plans, so you can probably imagine we will not get through 100 or so plans every time we meet. And so during that time period, we will look at students and we will determine those students who are in intervention if they are making progress. If they're not making progress, then we can take that student to the next step, which is an attendance hearing or the educational planning conference. But that's after a student has been in intervention for 60 days. The 61st day, we can then make that request to do an educational planning conference. Now there's some other ways that we can not have to wait since the 61st day. If that student is habitually triggers again, misses so many more days with an unexcused absence, then we can go for a hearing before we actually get to that 61st day. But if students are making progress, we they're supposed to stay in intervention for 60 days before we make a determination whether we want to go to a hearing. Once we go to a hearing, the tennis officer can determine if they would like to then proceed by going to the courts. And the court can then decide at that point if they want to revoke a student's driver's permit or their worker's permit. Um, I have received back from the courts about a stack of, from of I want to say judgments for students that now said they can no longer receive or be eligible for a worker's permit or for a driver's permit. And some of those students, you know, have questioned about, you know, they came to the office and wonder why they could not get their driver's permit approved, and that is because, or not driver's permit, or their worker's permit approved, and that's because they have gone through the whole process. It is a lengthy process, and so that's why it's very important that when we talk about students who are habitually absent, that remember, it's consecutive. So if all the teachers, if all seven hour teachers, the seven teachers in a day, do not mark that student unexcused, and it shows that student being present, then we have a kind of a gap in attendance. And then it will, from my understanding, it will start over. So that's why we need to have all the teachers each day take accurate attendance. And also, if a student arrives to your classroom late, um, I know many times that you are teaching and you do not have time to stop and record when that child arrives to class, but if you can devise some type of way where you can record down, whether it's on your clipboard, what time that student came in, because I know many of you have already taken attendance already, you marked that student absent. But if you mark that student absent, but they do arrive to your class, let's say 10 or 15 minutes late, we still need you to go back and re record that time that they arrived to class. Because from my understanding, I'm not exactly sure if it all happened yet, but now that minutes are counting as well, which goes toward their hours. So we need to be very accurate in terms of our record keeping when it comes to student attendance. We do have a third dean, and our acting dean, which is Ms. Roseman over here, and primarily she will be assisting with tardiness and truancy and skipping with and keeping us compliant, helping to keep us compliant with House Bill 410. And I'll say helping to keep us compliant because it is a difficult task for us right now, and we're hoping with the beginning of the school year next year, we can be on top of things right from the beginning of the school year, but right now we're doing our best to make sure that we come to bec become as compliant as possible at this time. And we do have a new attendance referral, 
that has been approved by the building committee. I did send out before we went over break in a few personnel notes about the new document that you will use just for truancy and attendance issues only. If we go to the next slide, you can see some of the benefits for having this referral, and I'm thankful to the building committee for approving this document, that it will be easy to complete, it's easy to submit, it will be easy for us to process, because when we receive referrals that were just paper, that we get so many referrals that in one day, it was very difficult for us to see all of Roxanne Allen's made referrals for truancy, because they can just be intermingled with all the other referrals. But now if it's going to one place, we can easily sort, because once it goes to a Google form, then it goes to Google Sheets, and then we can sort by students, and we can see all the students in terms of how many times they have been truant um, to certain classes. So here's the first page for the Start Truancy and Tardy Referral. I will recommend that you make this a favorite. If you're not sure how to make this a favorite, I did put some a summary how to do that in the last people personnel notes, but if you still need some assistance, I'll be more than happy to support you if needed. So this goes over just the hierarchy of consequences for tardy and truancy. And then you, you complete the electronic referral, student name, ID number, all the demographic information. And then at the bottom, I do recommend for your records that you do click that button to send you a copy of your responses so that you can have a record that, what you, um, that you have sent a referral for that student. Daily communication, this was also something I talked about. I did share this, I believe I, I think I should have shared this with everyone. Uh, this will be a lot easier, I believe, to communicate to the whole entire staff when it comes to students with exclusionary discipline. That will be our in-school suspension, out-of-school suspension, and expulsion, and also for detentions. Yes, you can actually click on each student who is part of your roster to see how many days they're suspended, but I know that just takes a lot of time. It's be really easy if every day you'll be able to see the students who are suspended, and then you can put their work aside, and then it also will help us that when we have to print out a sheet that when it's time for us to go to an athletic event, we can have that sheet right there when students come in, so we're able to make that determination at that point that that student is not allowed to that event because they are suspended. Um, when it also comes to BIC, it's also going to help us, is that I already talked to Mr. Fisher this morning, is that it's going to be a column that I want to add that will have how many days that student has served. So if they've been assigned three days, but at the end of, let's say, that the first day they did a one or three, but the next day they were absent, so they're still one or three. The next day they're absent, still one or three. And so you will know that they still need to report to BIC because they are not yet three or three. So that will help us as well to keep track of students when they do miss, when they have multiple days when it comes to their big assignment. I know you probably can't see this up here as well, but um, at the top you can see the big, and you can also see the infraction. The infraction would just be just very general or a failure to follow direction. It's not gonna be everything that a teacher wrote in terms of why that student was assigned to big. And I guess in that last column, I'm gonna add a last column of how many days served. So you are aware of how many days that student has served. And if they only had one, at the end of the day, it'll say one or one, then the next day they'll be off and you will know that they can return back to your classroom. Lunch detentions, we are adding lunch detentions now that, that we have Mrs. Roseman who can help out with that, is that lunch, deten ten lunch detentions, if I can say that, is one more disciplinary response that we can have for students when it comes to an infraction with the student code of conduct. And also it'll help us with fourth hour because we do, when students are sent out fourth hour, myself and the deans, we are here in the cafeteria. And so that means we have many times students who are in the office on that bench who are not supervised. And I know many students probably have caught on to that. And so they like to come down fourth hour and just hang out in the bench area because they know we're kind of in and out handling lunches. But now they'll be directed to go to the lunch detention room and they will be there for that remaining of that time period of fourth hour until it's time to go for their lunch hour. And then if they have been sent out, missing out on any of your classes, um, at the end of the day, if you can please make sure you submit that referral so that we can address the reason why they were sent out as soon as possible. Yes. It's room 306, thank you. Room 306, that's gonna be the room where we're gonna do our lunch detentions. 
And we're still seeking some additional clarification when it comes to using BIC for half days for students with disabilities. I've heard, I wanna say, conflicting information about this. And so I am still waiting for a definitive response from Beth Barrow before I actually use that. And so when it comes to students with disabilities and being assigned to BIC right now, um, we're not assigning those students, especially our students who are in our ED classification, because I need to receive actual definitive response from uh, Ms. Barrow. We're gonna continue with hall sweeps, but now hall sweeps, some of the hall sweeps now will take place at the Bell. We did scaffold students because Coming here to start, I was informed that hall sweeps had not, been take, had not taken place on a regular basis, so we really wanted to kind of ease students in to the hall sweep. So when they, were, they first took place that first week, it was like two or three minutes after the bell. Then we went down to a minute, then we went down in 30 seconds, and now we're gonna have some hall sweeps that are gonna happen right at the bell. Now I will say this first week coming back with students being assigned to lockers and not having book bags, most likely not gonna do hall sweeps this week. And with everybody trying to figure out where they're going and how to manage their time. But we will remind students that they are still responsible to get to their classes on time with that five minutes. That yes, they now have to put their book bags in their lockers, but they're gonna to have to figure out a way this week on how they're going to manage all their resources and manage that time because we're not allowed, allotting any additional time to go to lockers during the school day with, besides that five minutes. So I would say, but that this first week or so, we're gonna give them a little grace, but we're still gonna be reminding them, you still need to be on class on time. Being at your locker, being late to class because you were at your locker is not gonna be an excuse. We're going to provide as much support as we can to students this week with lockers. Um, I know from my experience in my previous school that a lot of freshmen struggle with combination locks, and a lot of those students would not even put the lock on the locker or would not lock it all the way because they didn't want to spend time doing a combination. I will not encourage that because then that leads to theft, and then that leads to a whole other host of issues that we do not need to have to address. So we will be trying to provide some support to students to help them with those combination locks. I wish the district could have sent out a link over break to some type of YouTube video where they could have practiced over the winter break because I know there'll be some issues with combination locks. I know how to do a combination lock, but trying to tell somebody how to do one, I still have not mastered that. Class meetings. We're gonna go over all this information with students, going over expectations, going over about hall sweeps and house before 10 at attendance. That's gonna take place this week. Our class meetings, you can see the dates. Thursday, January 10th, it's gonna be second hour be for our seniors, third hour for freshmen, and Friday, January 12th, second hour sophomores, and third hour juniors. If you have any additional questions for me, um, if this individual, you are more than likely, you are more likely, but you're more than welcome to either Email me or you can give me a question right now. Yes, I'm going to share the TARI document and also the referral document. I'm gonna send that for a couple of days until everybody, and you can just probably start discarding those emails, like, oh, that's just Roxanne saying that, that link again, until everyone has it and you have it a bookmark. But I will make sure that I send it for the next couple of days every day that you have the link to the truancy referral and also to a daily communication piece about suspension and big assignments and so forth. Any other questions before I hand the mic back over to Mr. Perosic? Yes, sir. Are we still doing first period tardies? So that leads into, Mr. Bernard asked, are we still doing first hour tardies? We still are handling it the same way. We're still having a tardy table. We actually are going to be implementing a digital scanning uh, component that if they have their ID, because this whole district, as we've been talking about for years, has been trying to get students to carry their ID with them. Um, as we're moving forward at start to trying to do that, they could either punch in their 900 number or swipe their card for the attendance. Um, and we're moving towards that as well. But we'll still have an attendance table. We'll still be taking the tardies down here. It's just gonna be quicker, faster, and cleaner uh, when the kids are late into the cafeteria, that's all. Um, 
But then, so that leads into what does this first week look like? And then what does the rest of the semester look like when it comes to this whole book bag policy, dress code, and different things like that? It doesn't look any differently than what you would expect it to look like. It really doesn't. You're going to, for the next few days, just like you probably would on any other day that we're going to enforce a dress code or enforce a book bag policy or enforce, you know, no big coats or anything like that, is just tell the kid, hey, take your hat off. Hey, go put your book bag back in your locker. You're going to mark them late if they're late to your class because of that. There's a consequence. But we're not going to sit there and hammer a kid the first few days because he's wearing a book bag. You're going to remind him to go to put his book bag back. Just like everywhere else, if they're defiant with you, that's a different story. Then we want to handle it right away. This week, next week, tomorrow, whatever. If they're defiant and absolutely are, are refusing to take off their hat, refusing to put their book bag away, refusing to take their blanket back to their locker, refusing to take off that big jacket of theirs, then yeah, we will handle it, write a referral, and send them down to the office. That's what we're going to do starting tomorrow. But give them the opportunity, please, like Roxanne said, give them a little bit of grace because we're going from we've done nothing administratively, very little, and very little staff-wise to enforce dress code and enforce book bags and enforce hats on, on heads and stuff like that. So we're going from zero. We're not going to go to 100 miles an hour tomorrow. It just can't happen that way. It's going to be too much work for you. Won't give you time to educate them. It'll be too much work for us. Won't give them us time to even consequent them appropriately. So let's just, I don't want to ease into consequences. I just want you to just give them a little grace and tell them to put stuff back in their locker. That's all I want. When they're defiant, because there will be a few, you know that. Probably a few in each one of your classes. And we're prepared for that. We're ready to go for that. I'm hoping and I'm wishing and I'm praying that when you give those kids an opportunity to say, hey, go put this back in your locker, that they'll do that and hopefully they'll come back on time. And hopefully it's a perfect world, okay? So that's what it's gonna look like. We're gonna remind them to go back, and then they're gonna go back to your class, and you're gonna mark them late if they're late, and if they're not late, great, you're gonna educate them like normal. It's the defiant kids right off the bat we wanna see. We are going to offer progressive discipline from that point forward as dress code issues become an issue like they did years ago. Um, but we'll answer Ms. Florkowski's question first. So, okay, so this is just, again, you handle how you want to handle your classroom, your classroom. This is a suggestion. If they come to you and it's before the bell rings, okay, and they're carrying a book bag, they have a hat on, they got a jacket on, a big winter jacket, they've got a blanket, something along those lines, you're going to say, hey, Kip, you got to take that back to your locker. I'm marking you late if you're late after the bell, but you got to take it back to your locker. And then you mark them late if they come back to your class late. That's it. If you choose to give them a pass, I wouldn't suggest that. That goes against the whole idea of not allowing these kids the first 10 minutes to have hall passes. We're trying to eliminate that. It doesn't help when we as administrators have stopped kids in the hallway in the beginning, and then we try to stop them again later on, and we try to stop them again later on, and we're not consistent. Equally, it doesn't help when a kid walks into your first period class wearing hats, book bags, and nothing is being done either. Because then that person goes to the second hour class, and then that person goes to the third hour class, and then the fourth hour class is Miss Florkowski's class, and she's writing them all up, you know, and as she should, because they're being defiant. So it doesn't help on our end when we're not consistent right off the bat in the morning, but it doesn't help either unless you guys are consistent in following and enforcing the dress code as well. And it's difficult. Most of us, I've been here 11 years, and most I see very familiar faces. We used to go in, if you remember, doing belt checks. We used to walk into classrooms. If you weren't here 11 years ago, we used to walk into classrooms and see if a student had a belt. 
And then, and so I'm letting you know, we're going back to that. We're going back to random classroom visits for dress code. I'm not here to, I'm not here to go into those classrooms and be like, oh, you didn't write this kid up for a dress code. You may be teaching and you're not noticing that that kid's doing whatever. I don't, hopefully you are. Hopefully you can stop it at the door, but we'll do the random dress code checks like we've done in the past, okay? Um, what's frustrating would be to walk into that classroom and there's four book bags, eight kids with winter hats on when we do a random dress code check. If a kid slides in with a book bag and he gets past you, he gets past you. They're going to get past you all the time. They get past us all the time. We get it. But please do the best job collectively, and we'll do our best job collectively to work together to enforce this. Um, it's not a difficult task if we're all working together. It's really, really small task for all of us. Um, and so I know we have lots of hands that are being raised. So right here, Don Forrester. Okay, that's great. So first hour teachers, if you wanted to pull that up on your computer, that would be great. Also, 15 hard copies were made or 12 hard copies, whatever the number is. Every single CPO will have actually a hard copy in their hand while they're walking the halls. Every single one of the administrators has a hard copy in their hands when they're walking the halls. Every single secretary, I shouldn't say every single secretary, every secretarial office, the attendance office, the guidance office, and the main office all have hard copies when that kid stops down and says, I don't know my locker combination. You know and I know there'll be two or three kids that don't know their locker combination all year long, and they'll ask for help all year long. Okay, we get that. They get away with it a couple of times. Oh, you, you won one over on us a couple of times. After that, it's like, I'll give you your locker combination, but here's your late pass because you're late. You know, the same thing. Same thing applies. But it's a great suggestion. First hour teachers, especially if you open that Google Doc up of the locker combinations, everyone will have it to help the students out. So, yes? So, for dress code violations, how would you So, again, they're going to be, it's not a dress code violation this first week, meaning dress code violation. That would be them being defiant because they're not fixing their problem. You're talking about the week after next week, third week, so on and so forth. I would, yeah, I would send them out, but be prepared that we're going to issue the consequence and they're coming right back to your classroom for something like a dress code. If they can fix that for you, have them fix it. That, that obviously solves the problem. That, that to me is, is a lot easier, way easier. Again, Tyson and I were even talking this morning. We'll be stopping the kids. Come after this first week, we're in the cafeterias where we see a big influx of people changing. They go back to their lockers, they, especially now that they'll be at their lockers. They'll change their dress attire. They'll do a lot of different things. This first week, we'll tell them, you know, hey, at the bell, you need to change it. But after that, there's no warning to them in the cafeteria even during fourth hour. If they're wearing a hat, here's your Saturday school or here's your lunch detention. Go to the lunch detention room. Here's your whatever that consequence may be. So we're going to try to enforce it the same way. So, I know there was another hand up. Yeah, no. No. <laughs> Goes to their locker. I mean, if they leave it there, I'm not, I would never, ever suggest that they leave it there because then all of a sudden that liability turns on an adult. So, that answer to you is all, sort of the student, to me, would always be, take it to your locker. Now, if they turn the corner and drop it in the hallway, that responsibility then lies on them. I could at least say, or you, or a teacher, or we as adults can at least say, the suggestion was for them to go to their locker. It was not to put it outside. That has caused problems in other high schools. I can tell you that right now with theft, big time. Yes? I wouldn't give them passes as much as I would tell them to go to their locker. Yeah, that's going to be frustrating, and I get that, that first week. It really will be. If it's the same kid, oh, like, for it would be four days for you, right? Because you'd have that kid, well, some of you have mul the kids multiple hours, but if that same kid comes to you on Tuesday and on Wednesday, on Thursday, I, I suppose if it's the same kid, if you wanted to, to write them up, feel free. I would still send him to go to his class, 
but I would then write a ref I would still send him to go to his locker and have him come back. But don't have him leave your class completely and have him come down to the office. You can still write that referral then. Third day in a row, after being warned on Tuesday and Wednesday, still was defiant by not doing that. But again, starting on Monday of next week, it all, you know, all those warnings and stuff are off. You'll send them to your lockers, you can write the referrals, and we'll start that progressive discipline. So it's, it's, an, ugly, it's an ugly animal. It really is. Dress code, it always has been. Um, so I want to kind of concentrate real quick because this might help some stuff out too. What are we really looking for in this dress code? Because again, for dress code for us here at Start High School, went from super strict at one time to like nothing. Now we're at nothing to going to 100 again. It's not necessarily fair for us to be dress code police, which I know most of us don't want to be. And it's not necessarily fair to the kids either because they went from nothing for to to hundred percent so what I'm asking for is some of the uh, is obvious it's got to be uh, let's do obvious a book bag a book bag it's a book bag that's on their shoulders it's a book bag it's a duffel bag those are book bags string bag. I would string bag is a book bag I would not this is just me it's a suggestion I would not worry about the girl even though it ticks you off because she sits behind her purse and she gets on her cell phone and you can't stand it. But I wouldn't, I would, I'm not gonna push the issue with a purse versus a book bag. I, the whole idea of, is it too big? Is, can you fit a book in it, then it's a book bag? I can tell you my wife doesn't own a purse then. <laughs> my wife only owns book bags. And I can tell you all of her book bags are purses and they're all large enough to carry a book in, every single one that she owns. So I'm not going to be the one that tells this girl, this student, that that's a, not a purse. Because it is a purse. And you know the difference between a purse and a book bag. So I don't want to be the purse police. I don't want you to be the purse police. Be a book bag, a book bag, a backpack, all that. I, those are the things that concentrates on that, not the purses. Then they do. OK, the next thing is. Headgear, okay? Again, we'll have an argument till we're blue in the face with the district on support on certain headgears, right? So first of all, let's just get past any religious headgear stays. We're not even gonna question them, that stays on their head. It's not for us to say, are you of this religious belief or not? If they're wearing uh, a headgear of a religious belief, that stays. Hats don't. Baseball caps, no. Winter caps, no. Do-rags, no. Uh, shower caps, no. Bonnets, no. Hoodies on the head, no. That's going to be a big one. Do-rags, I already said no. Those are going to be the ones that we issue with. A headband that's like an inch or two thick. And again, don't get your ruler out and be like, man, nah, that's larger than two inches. <laughs> If it's a, I bought my daughter a Nike headband that ties in the back, and it's about two inches. If a student's wearing that, then she's going to wear it. That's, and if a student, whether he or she has the hair to support it, is wearing it, we're okay with it. We're, that's not going to be an issue. Allie, can you stand up, please? See what she has in her head? That is going to be allowed. Boy or girl, short hair or long hair. It's not going to be an issue. Fur or no fur? That's, that's, let's not concentrate on that. Again, I don't want you all to be that police, nor do we want to do it. It's the obvious. The obvious baseball caps. It's the obvious winter hats. It's the obvious do-rags, hoodies on the head, so on and so forth. Um, yes? Yes, yes, that's all okay. As long as the bandana is not covering their head, if they use it as a headband and they wrap it in two inches, it's fine. At colors. It's a color. Every color is a gang color, by the way. Yes. Yes. No, no, not an electronic tardy. That electronic tardies, Roxanne can explain maybe again in more detail, but it'll be after the fourth tardy will be the electronic one. It's like when you write a referral. So those electronic tardies aren't 
cumulative, or they are cumulative, but they aren't written every single time a kid's late. They're written when they hit a threshold. Yes, Margaret, you can. <laughs> and you know what's nice about that is you send it, and it's it to us in a second, and it goes onto a Google Doc that will have, you know, Tyson Harder's name on it, and then we look on that Google Doc. It also has Tyson Harder's name because we do it by alphabetical, and we could get Tyson Harder and, and add four or five truancy referrals together and say, hey, listen, you've been truant. You've been true to this class, this class, this class. Now, we're not cumulative, because that's Forrester, Forrester's question, because he's a math guy. If you're late two times to your class and late two times to your class, does that count as four? I wish it would, but it doesn't. Chances are, I'm just letting you know, chances are you're going to get them to hit four. You know what I'm saying? Anyways, you're going to get them to hit six. We're not going to count up every single one. We will try our hardest and, and accumulate it together and say this is a truancy issue, or this is an attendance issue, this is a lateness issue, um, by writing that electronic one. Yes? My question was, are we defining absence from a class as far as being truant attendance after or attendance after? Absent from a class is when they don't show up to your class ever. Okay. Absent. So then, but like in Margaret's case, you said he's 30 minutes late, we, we send that referral. You, you can send that referral for truancy. So there, there, I, I believe Roxanne can answer this possibly, and I don't know, I believe, yes, that will be a teacher's discretion. However, the general rule has always been like over five minutes late, they're considered truant. And we can handle that as truancy in our building level, we can handle that, but you still need to mark their time because though, that time that they're in your class, that counts towards their attendance. And just like we don't want to hurt them, or help them by say, not marking them absent. We don't want to hurt them either by saying they were absent for 47 minutes. When each one of those minutes counts now, and they're actually only absent for 40, or they're only absent for five minutes. Do you see what I'm saying? So just because they're truant, don't mark them unexcused absence from your class and never put back the, reg the time they come back. So you, yes, you can. You can mark absent. And then you could, when you ch you would put the time in, that will let us know that that person arrived in your class. It becomes an unexcused late is all that is. Yes. Other questions about that? And believe me when I say this, we're going back to the basics, so it's going to take a little bit of work for us, a little bit of work for you, and we're going to open to the questions. So, And we'll be open to suggestions, and we'll be, I'm sure there'll be, again, a couple of people here uh, including myself, they are going to be a little ticked off because the kid won. Okay, the kid's going to win every now and again. I don't want them to win, but they're going to win every now and again. They're going to get one over on us. Just let's ease it through. Time will give them the appropriate consequence that they need. Um, I discussed the book bag policy. I don't know where we're at with that. Oh, emergency button is the next slide. So I was here for. Well, almost two full days last week, two half days-ish, uh, and the telephone people, we'll just call them, uh, John Welsh and Randy Peace, were here working on the telephones for their fourth day. They finished today. If you were in your room and your extension starts with a 2-6, you noticed, if you noticed, on your phone, you have new tabs uh, that are on your phone line. And one of them is a red little tab next to a button that says emergency on it. We talked as the building leadership team uh, about getting this emergency line working in this building because it has never worked in this building since we started. So here's how it works. If your extension is 2-6, your phone tab stuff changed, you have an emergency button. I'll go in a minute and talk about when we press that button because that's another whole discussion. But if needed, and you press that emergency button, it will ring into the main office, my office, Roxanne's office, the two deans' office, Aaron Banks' office, and the attendance office simultaneously, and it rings where that emergency line is on our phone, so we know it's an emergency phone, not a regular phone. Matter of fact, the ringtone is even different. They practiced it last week when I was here a couple of different times. They practiced it today as well. Um, 
First person who picks it up, the phone stops ringing. Okay, and then you can talk. I'll explain again a little bit how that can be worked very beneficially for a teacher because um, there's an intercom process to it as well. If your extension's 2-4, nothing's changed on your phone. And the reason why I say that is, is you have an emergency button. It's the very top line on the left, I believe. And it's not in red, but it reads emergency. That button works for you. If we've tested it, we've tried it, it works. It rings in the same lines. So if you're 2-4, it's the top button. If you're 2-6, you have a new tab, and now it's red, it says emergency, and you're actually the second button down. That's the only difference. Here's how it works. You can either just push the button, and it becomes an intercom. So if you're by your phone, which you'll need to be by your phone then, and there's an emergency, and you push that button, it rings, and we either pick up, or we could push the button and have it be an intercom, um, and then you state your emergency. Um, what would be nice, not nice, but it, we have kids that have seizures, we have kids that are having some type of medical issue, or some uh, medical issue, maybe even in a, a career tech classroom. You could be working with a kid and telling another student to push the button, and you could then speak on the intercom while you're still working with the kid. You don't have to leave the child unattended who's having a heart attack or who's having a medical issue to go push the emergency button. Or you have a student explain, hey, can you dial 24400? And then they say, how many zeros do I got to put? What number is it? You could just tell them to push the emergency button. I would, this is why I would suggest that you never use that unless it's an absolute emergency. I'm not going to sit here and try to discuss all the emergencies or all the things that aren't emergencies, but believe me when I say this, we've had quite a few different phone calls made down to the office that were dire emergency and nobody got to them. They were unattended because they're either on another phone call, we're out in the halls, we're doing something else, they're not answered. And then we've had some on the flip side of it where we've had phone calls saying they need a CPO in a room and the emergency was not even close to what you would consider an emergency. So please use that with your discretion. It is an emergency in my opinion. It is used for medical issues. If there's a fight obviously in your hallway, uh, if a kid refuses to take his hoodie off in your class, that's not an emergency. It's not, I'm sorry. Please don't use it for that. If that's overused, kids will know that that's overused too and it just becomes again uh, a non, um, it becomes a non-entity. It doesn't, it doesn't work well. It's not efficient. It's not effective either. Um, if you have questions about what you should or shouldn't use your emergency button on, you can talk to me about it afterwards. But again, use your discretion. Uh, emergencies, emergencies only. Next, school resource officer. Uh, obviously, we still have Officer Bay. She's here. Her office is still in the same office. We are having extra support in our building. Officer Dave Vanuk, who is our school, I don't understand the difference between school resource officer and school resource officer who's TPD versus TPS, but Officer Bay's TPD, he's TPS. Um, his office will be, if you know where Ray Lynn's office used to be, right outside this cafeteria, that will be his office. Um, his office will be where the cameras are primarily, there, there's two monitors there, that's where the cameras will primarily be used if we need to look up camera, or camera footage uh, for anything like that. It will be done in that office primarily. It's still accessible in the dean's office, it's still accessible in my office, it's still accessible in Roxanne's office. His major role is here for, uh, he's housed here, he's, he, he's ours, he's housed here every day. He will get called, okay, he will get called to go to Elmhurst, he will get called to go to the area schools in the start feeder pattern, so he won't be here every day, all day long. Just like Officer Bay is not necessarily here all day, every day, all day long. But there is some shared responsibility when it comes to that. His main role while he's here, obviously, is to kind of be more eyes and ears in the hallway during arrival and dismissal. And then fourth hour, we had a meeting and we all agreed that fourth hour for 1039 to 1209, his primary role will be the athletic and music wing circulating. Circulating, circulating, cleaning out the athletic wing, cleaning out the back hallways, cleaning out the music wing of students that don't belong there. Um, so if you have classes in those hours, make sure your kids are in those classes. Otherwise, he's gonna be sweeping them out, taking them either to lunch detention or the office, 
uh, whatever it should be. Most of our issues this year have happened around fourth hour. And when I say issues, I don't mean fights and stuff like that, but I mean like kids leaving the building, going to get high, coming back, open, propping up back doors. It's been the back doors in those two areas, by the little theater and back by the weight room or the wrestling room. So he'll be constantly monitoring and monitoring those bathrooms as well. Um, and then if somebody needs a CPO in the athletic area or music wing, he can go, instead of sending one of our CPOs from the main area of the building over to the athletic wing, just in alone takes two minutes to walk over there, uh, we'll be able to uh, use him in that capacity as well. Um, so that should be, uh, should be great. Yes. Everything else is staying the same as far as I know, correct, Roxanne? We have just added an extra person, Dave Banook, in the athletic area. So, yes. You, you look like you, you got. Doing that with me anyway. Okay. All right. So, all of the CPO stuff we're going to address with Roxanne. Right? We'll be on top of it then um, and let us know. Did you, we'll make sure that, I think at one point we sent out to the staff even where, who should be where, when they should be there. I know that we shared it at building leadership team in the morning. Uh, I don't know how far that went, but we'll get back on it and I'll talk to Roxanne. I have no problem. I don't want you guys monitoring the CPOs just like I don't want mon <laughs> CPOs monitoring where you guys are. No, I'm not. I'm just asking Correct. If somebody's placed up there yes. At one point in time during lunch, if I, if I have the schedule somewhat accurate in my head, there's only one up there. At other times throughout fourth period, there's two. But most of the time, there's only one during fourth period. But again, we'll look at it right after this. Yep. The next one, next slide is pop machines. We're buying more. What? We're... we're I called, Tyson called, we have work orders in. Uh, I called again January 3rd, spoke to another guy uh, who's again turned me to another person. I gave him my cell number both different times. They still have not uh, calibrated him the way that I want them to do it. What we're trying to do is have the machines turn off at 745, turn on at 1039, shut off at 1209, and then turn on at 245. Um, they can do it. The work order's in. Uh, it was supposed to have been done over break. I gave him my cell number. I said I live three miles away. I'm not going out of town. Call me. I'll be up there. It is still has not been done yet. So, Ray Lynn, I told her, we pulled the pot machines out. We unplugged them. They're done. Until that gets turned over, we're going to unplug the pot machines, and there's going to be no access to these, out, these pot machines outside of the cafeteria. There'll still be access to that one. That's a different one. But the pop machines right there, um, I just noticed that one. That's why I said that. If that's owned by Coke, we'll do the same thing. Um, once they come in here, I don't mind them being programmed during those hours. I think it's OK for the kids to go buy a pop at lunchtime when they're at lunch. What I ask of you all is please monitor their, I know they say they're going to the restroom. I know you can't control that they say they're going to the restroom, and then they come and buy a pop. And it's during fourth hour. If we stick to the no, if we stick to the t not anyone going out for 10 minutes before, 10 minutes at the end, and we stick to only two, we could at least limit those number of kids that possibly are doing that. If we see any kids, administratively, if we see any kids in the hallways with pops, we can stop them. We can confiscate their pops. We can do all that. So don't let them into your classroom then with it either. You know, especially during that fourth hour when that pop machine's back on. So I know some teachers, everyone allows different rules and different things like that. But again, working together and trying to make this tighter again and not having, we had more issues with kids going to this pop machine this year than we ever have, ever, ever, ever. So pop machines will be regulated. And until they're regulated, they're off. Kathleen. So, yeah, so here's the deal. When those paddles first originated, yeah, the paddles were, were for the kids that are going to the office because the counselor called for them. They need them. Or a dean called for them. Or whomever they called for them. 
or maybe you're working with another teacher and you're and the teacher needs to see that kid you use the paddle i don't i don't feel it's fair to those kids to use their agenda book for that the agenda books are used for restroom or if they say to, in the middle of class i left my such and such thing in the lo in the locker that's then they should use the agenda book No. <laughs> they do steal paddles. They also steal other kids' agenda books, too. <laughs> yeah, but you're one of... A hundred. Remember that you're one of one hundred people in this in this room right here. That <laughs> you take that parent phone call then. So the paddle concept was new to me, but if you know you're using the paddles, I understand the reason why because you don't want to utilize their passes for going to the restroom, but. I have encountered students in the hallways and the paddle was just blank. And so they may have, you know, erased it, which my response now is like, well, if you erased it, now you're out in the hallway and to me you're considered to be truant now because you have not been authorized to be out in the hallway. And so if they receive a paddle from you, then please make sure, like we said in a previous slide, that they have their name on it the destination and time, and if you could, put your signature and let that student know it's their responsibility to keep that paddle with all the information on there. Because if they are stopped by administrative personnel and they do not have that information on the paddle, they could be subject to a disciplinary response to being in the hallway without a valid hall pass, if that's something you're gonna use. Now I realize you use dry erase markers and a paddle, if it kind of you know brushes past a book bag, something like that, it's gonna be erased. So, not anymore, they'll be in lockers. Oh, not even book bags, I'm sorry. Well, that is my mistake. Yeah. But if it, but they mean to make sure they carry that paddle like that down the hallway so it does not touch anything. Right. And so they can get to their destination and then they can come to the counselor's office or, or whatnot and, and go from there. But I generally, if a student is sent down to the office, I would generally give them a paper pass and then says that you know they've come back from their in my office now they're going back to your classroom with my signature so that's in my practice but however you want to continue the paddles but please make sure it has that information on there thank you yes colleen so yes we will um just like everybody just like Ten years ago, nine years ago, eight years ago, we will stand over there with the garbage cans. You're not allowed to leave. You're not allowed to leave. Again, I'm not going to be the one that says lift up your hoodie because you got a pop bottle in your in, in your hair. Those girls with the purses, they're going to be able to put them in there. We're not. I'm not going to. Hey, let me check your purse. This isn't you know the Lakers game. You know, I'm not going to be able to do all that. Are kids going to get away with stuff? Absolutely. They're kids. They're smart. They're good like that. They will. We will do the best job that we can to make sure the kids do not leave this cafeteria with food or drink. Yes. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why we cut off a la carte slushies and all that, because they were leaving with them and they were all over the place. Yes. So the question is about how the, the, the communication piece between classrooms and tackle. Let's down there and that's a, a that's they, they shouldn't be. Okay. okay. Well, they should go to you if they need to. And you as a teacher should be able to do that. Um, between Roxanne and I, we can talk to Rob, and then there's a new woman in Tackle as well, and readdress that, and we will kind of reaffirm that with Tackle and you as a staff, probably via email. Yeah.
So just so if everyone can hear this or not, it's about students being in tackle. If they're in the tackle room, the, the suggestion is that you mark them absent because they're not in your room if you didn't give them permission uh, to be in tackle. Uh, it's the responsibility to tackle people, so on and so forth. The difference between tackle and testing would be is those testing kids are excused. All it counts is an excused absence. They still get to make up their work. Where tackle, if they were there without your permission, would be unexcused absence. But yes, it is a responsibility. There needs to be a better communication piece. There always has to has been a better communication piece, and there still needs to be a better one because it's not working well. Yeah. Were ED kids. A lot of those kids are in tackle, so how does that work? So again, the ED kids, or for that matter, any students that are on the no hall pass list that are also tackle kids, if they are a reg ed kid that's in a classroom that's not with a para, okay, uh, and they, it, you can see it as a teacher, you know your kids. I know you know your kids. If they're just saying they want to go to tackle, then you can say, you know, I, again, I, these are just suggestions. Hey, is this an emergency or can you wait until you get done with the work? If it's an emergency, then we can call for a CPO or you could write a pass and they can go to tackle, but you're excusing them out to go. If it's an ED kid on the no hall pass list and all that, and they're in an ED classroom, then send an ED para with them to tackle. Because that's going to be all of about four minutes that they're out of your classroom. You're going to have the para walk down, drop them off, come back to your classroom. That's my suggestion. And most of those kids on that no hall pass list, unfortunately, are ED kids. Can you explain what Tackle is? No. <laughs> Tackle is a mental health agency um, that is supported very much by Toledo Public Schools. Um, the effectiveness, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I know it's effective for some. I don't know how effective it is for all of the students that participate in it. Uh, hopefully, it does, hopefully they're, they're, they're doing great jobs with it. There is, yes. So if there's mental issues, emotional issues, yes, there is people there that are licensed to help them. We also have counselors that are here, and that's their role. I would imagine the first line of defense would be go to their counselor if there's an issue. Okay, if they are a tackle kid, and that's where that communication line, that piece needs to be tightened between tackle, you, tackle, counselors, tackle, administration, because if you're having a kid that's having an issue, they should be aware of it. And maybe between the counselor and the tackle program, they can get the right help that's needed. And maybe tackle can't provide something that a counselor can, and maybe a counselor can't provide something that tackle can. But yes, that communication just needs to be, it always has, like I said, has to be a better way to do this. Because I think the resource is good, it just needs to be effective. And it's, I, in my opinion, it's not effective. Moving on to the next, oh, extra support. Just generally speaking, I can tell you this. Between Toledo Federation Teachers of Union, between TAP Union, and between administration at the board level, they understand, they know, we know there's a need for extra support here. All of those entities have voiced their concern to get extra support. I can tell you that. We're looking at a lot of different things. I personally met with Mr. Gant for about two hours one day, and a lot of it was about extra support that's needed. It's all of the extra support that you could possibly imagine that we have discussed for at least the last staff meeting, uh, as well as some of the stuff that was on the survey that when I looked at the responses, we need extra help in this area. We need extra help in this area. We need extra help in this area. I can tell you one thing, just right off the bat, is Officer Vanuk. There's one extra person that's going to be in this building under the quote unquote security umbrella that's already being implemented in. Hopefully there'll be more, but I'm just saying there's at least one other person just starting in second semester, so that's not going, gone unnoticed. Gloria, what? Oh, and the third dean of Amy Roseman being here for attendance. So two of our major issues already uh, has been heard and has been, you know, followed through with. So I'm happy with that. Again, more is needed though. You know that and I know that. There was a statistic somewhere, I think Gloria, no, or a I think Andy might have made it out. If you cover the square footage of the building, 
and how much a CPO has to cover, it's like well over 60,000 square feet, just to let you know. So again, 303,000 square feet, five CPOs on a good day. And all of my responses and all of Gloria's responses and all of Ann and everybody's responses is on a good day. Because we can't predict the bad days. We can't predict the kids or the CPOs that are absent. We can't predict the ones that are sick. We can't predict when they're being pulled. But on a good day, we still are lack, we still need more support here, even on a good day. So that's what we're fighting for. Yes. Absolutely. That that's right in that agenda. Right in there. So uh, she was talking about extra counseling support as well. So the next one, town hall meetings, whether you read it or not in Aaron Banks' um, newsletter, or I might have sent something out too at the end of the break. Another way, a better way, hopefully, to communicate to this staff on a more regular basis instead of once a month or always via email is up in the library uh, every Wednesday from 7.15 till about 7.30, 7.40, however long it runs. I will be up there having what I named a town hall meeting, kind of brings it back to the, again, back to the basics, kind of have a smaller, intimate feel about it. And there's no specific agenda except just to communicate what's going on in the building and what has gone on and what's gonna go on in the near future. So instead of like saying, hey, here's all of May's activities, you know, in May, we can kind of look, for, look ahead of the stuff that's going on. There's a lot of issues that are going on in this building that we've discussed as a staff that do we notify the staff, do we not notify the staff? If there's an immediate threat to staff or students, then you need to be notified right away. If there's not an immediate threat to the staff, but we sh need to be informed of it because this is our building, then that's kind of stuff that I'll share too. Um, I'll be sharing, it'll just be like an administrative report, a lot of question and answer time. I imagine the first couple might have to do with book bags, dress code, compliance, attendance, and how are we handling it, and what's going on, and what if this, and what if that, or I had Johnny do this, or I had Jill do that, uh, and I'm more than welcome to be, to be there to answer all those questions. Um, it is completely optional, do not feel free, do not feel uh, obligated to go, uh, but I will be there every Wednesday um, for as long as there's a need, and my intent is to have it every Wednesday for the rest of the school year. So even if there's just two people, I'll be more than willing to sit down with two people and just kind of talk about what's going on. Yes? Sure, sure, sure. Ms. Allmiller just, just offered her services and she will be the secretary at our town hall meetings. She was nominated. All in favor, say aye. 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 There you go. She's in. See how easy that is? That's teamwork right there. Unless she's absent. Mr. Bernard, volunteered if she's absent. No, what do you need, Mr. Bernard? So once a, are we going back to once a month staff meetings? That, that's the question. So we're in a weird spot start high school and some other high schools about getting our tbt time in that's so precious and having a staff meeting right when they did away with and i don't want to say did away with but did away with the two hour delays in return or in exchange for the getting rid of the two hour delays we were given two days off so if you remember one was in the first semester I forget what day it was. Oh, that was the one before Thanksgiving. And then I believe one's the one in February. That will be February 15th. So we have a long weekend of the 15th, 16th, 17th, and 18th. So it's not like we got rid of two hour delays. We just were exchanged them for two days off from school. What that did was is eliminate our opportunity to meet as a staff like this. That's why I'm offering you a weekly town hall meeting to communicate to you <laughs> every week instead of once a month. I can do it four times a week. That's the offer. Four times a month, I mean. How do you feel about that? Wow. 
Now you have time for your career tech TBT. Um, are there any other questions? And believe me, I'm sure there's some stirring around in your head. We still have questions and stuff that we're going to try to work out in kinks. Obviously, the tackle one's a big one that we're going to try to work out a communication piece for. If you have any other questions, feel free to ask me, ask Roxanne. Uh, we'll work. And again, everything that we've done thus far for this semester, we have tried our hardest to incorporate the entire building leadership team through communication, through meetings, through emails. So we're all working together, and that's how we want to move forward second semester. The last few slides of this will be for testing, and Matt has the opportunity uh, to talk about the graduation, graduation requirements, and different testing. Well, you are now. Hi, everybody. I apologize. I didn't know that I was talking about the new graduation options um, Mr. Prozik just told me about. Um, but <laughs> right, before, right before we went on Christmas break, the state of Ohio brought back the alternative pathways from last year for the seniors. So the same exact pathways that last year's seniors had, this year's seniors will have. They also brought on um, alternative pathways for next year's seniors as well but they're just a little bit different. So you guys will, I'm sure, be getting that information at some point coming forward. Huh? I tried to make it through this whole thing without talking, sorry. Um, I did ask the district if we could have some time before going into those alternate pathways till we at least get the test scores back. So we're gonna mention it at the senior meeting this week, just to them. But after that, uh, we probably won't start anything till about February-ish. Uh, that gives us time to see who doesn't need to do anything extra, who got higher scores. The counselors will be scheduling almost all of January, so it just gives us some extra time. And what's the point of getting students started when they might not need to do it? So more information will come closer to February about it. Thanks. Grades are due tomorrow by 4 p.m. Make sure they are all done. <laughs> Laura Haltman, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I don't know how to follow that. That's kind of harsh. Drop the mic. I know I should. Drop the mic. <laughs> well, the last thing that I'm going to talk about um, is the December retesting that we did. Um, we had a total of 2,687 tests that were taken um, during that time, which is a lot. Um, you guys all did a fantastic job sending them. Um, we appreciate that very much. We were testing. I mean, you guys know we were calling people out, so thank you for bearing with us um, with all of that. Um, just to give you an idea though, that was only about like 53% of the tests that the kids needed to retake. However, we did really well. I mean, we had two sessions running for 14 days and they were almost completely full every time. So we did really well. So Glory and I and the other administrators, thank you guys for helping us with that. Um, but looking ahead, not done yet. I don't know if they can see it anyways. Um, but looking ahead um, for testing, as Aaron just talked about, we have the new alternative options and that I kind of touched on. One of those options is the work keys testing. Um, so all kids that are not in career tech, they will be starting to take those, but we probably won't start them until February like Aaron said. So just know that that will be coming. We will be doing those in the computer labs. Um, you guys will have the list of who's testing and when. That'll be more assigned than say how the December OSTs went. Okay, we do know that um, on March 6th, that is gonna be the SAT test. That's gonna be for all juniors. What I don't know is if we're gonna have an early release day or if it's only juniors gonna be there on that day. The testing office hasn't shared any of that information yet. Once I get it, you guys will all have that. I assume that we will, because we've done it that way for the last two years, but nothing's for sure on that. Um, and then lastly, the OST testing for the end of course exams and the, re, uh, the retakes are gonna be starting shortly after that. We are probably gonna stay with the same format that we have the last two years. Um, they will probably have early release days. They haven't released anything. So I don't know if we're gonna do, say, English one, part one on one day, and then English one, part two on another. 
I don't have any of that information. But what I can say is normally the early release days happen at the very beginning of the testing window. I sent you guys all the testing calendar at the beginning of the year, so you should have it in your Google Drive. If you need it, just send me an email and I'll send it to you again. Yes, Dawn. I can ask them, but they are normally they already have it set well in advance because um, they go through. I think they go through the cabinet and the upper administration. But I'll definitely bring that to the testing office's attention for sure. Yeah. Right. I would agree. But I can tell you from the suggestions that I've made in the past, most things don't happen. They do what they want to do. But I can definitely suggest that. Okay. Any other questions about the upcoming testing? No. Great. All right, um, just to end, I just want to thank everybody for, for being here. I know we have to, but just being here, being attentive, being willing to make some changes that are needed. Um, I appreciate it. We appreciate it. The students appreciate it. Your colleagues appreciate it. Uh, you're free to go. It's 2.20. Have a great day, and we'll be back tomorrow starting out working together again. Thank you.